talk some true crime. On April 19, 1995, at 902 a.m., a yellow rented Ryder box truck containing 4,800 pounds or 2,200 kilograms of a mixture of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, nitromethane, and diesel fuel detonated in front of the Alfred P. Mora Federal Building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Timothy McVeigh was described as a quiet and shy youth. He says that he was bullied in school and fantasized about retaliating against bullies. This was where he developed a strong disliking for anyone he viewed as pushing others around. Once introduced to guns by his grandfather, he started reading Soldier of Fortune magazine and told people he wanted to be a gun store owner. In 1988 20-year-old McVeigh joined the United States Army and was intending to advance to special forces training. He had been accepted to a three-week school that assessed a person's capability to handle special forces programs intense training. Before he had had a chance to begin school, he was deployed to Kuwait to fight in Operation Desert Storm. While there, he said that he was ordered to execute surrendering prisoners and saw so much carnage along the roads that he started to question the intentions of the U.S. military. After he was discharged from the military, he became suspicious of the federal government and believed that they would take away everyone's right to own guns. He was increasingly vocal about high taxes and was pushed even closer to the edge when the government sent him a letter stating that he had been overpaid while serving in the army and that he owed them $1,058. In 1992 federal authorities were in a standoff with Randy Weaver and his family on their northern Idaho property. Initial gunfire killed Weaver's son and a U.S. Marshal after the death of one of their own, and federal agents laid siege to the cabin. Over the course of 11 days, they killed Weaver's wife and took him and a family friend into custody, now known as the Ruby Ridge Standoff. McVeigh was sure that this was the beginning of the government stripping its citizens of their guns. Randy Weaver had moved to that area to live off the grid away from the government and have a large stockpile of weapons. The 51-day standoff in Waco, Texas, in 1993 solidified McVeigh's idea that the U.S. government had to become the biggest of bullies. He traveled to Waco to show his support for the people in the compound. He distributed pro-gun rights, literature, and bumper stickers that said, quote, when guns are outlawed, I will become an outlaw, end quote. He believed that the government was only there because they didn't want citizens to have guns. McVeigh had had enough of the U.S. government pushing around the little guy, and he was going to take action. He spent about five months traveling the country, where he attended many gun shows. He sold survival gear and copies of a book called The Turner Diaries. The book is a fictional account of a man who takes part in an apocalyptic overthrow of the U.S. government, leading to the systematic extermination of non-whites and liberals. The Southern Poverty Law Center described it as quote the Bible of the racist right end quote. It's appropriate to note that a federal building was bombed in the book, and that's believed to be the inspiration for McVeigh's bombing. He also spent time with a couple of guys he had met while serving in the Army, Terry Nichols, and Michael Fortier. They had become friends while in the service due to having similar ideologies regarding guns and the Second Amendment. McVeigh spent time staying with Nichols, where he was taught how to make bombs and began meticulously planning an act of terror against the United States. When he disclosed his plans to blow up a federal building, 40 years declined to participate beyond assisting him with location scouting. In later interviews, McVeigh said that his first plan was to assassinate several targets. His potential targets were Attorney General Janet Reno, Judge Walter S. Smith Jr., who handled the Branch Davidian trial, and Lon Horiuchi, a member of the FBI who shot and killed Vicki Weaver the standoff at Ruby Ridge in 1992. After deciding that multiple assassinations would be too difficult, he changed his plan to bombing one location that housed multiple federal agents. He felt that federal agents had become soldiers and needed to strike them at their command center. On April 19, 1995, 
McVeigh and Nichols loaded a rented rider truck with a bomb that contained approximately 4,800 pounds or 2,200 kilograms of ammonium nitrate and nitromethane. McVeigh stopped to light two-minute views before parking the truck in front of the Alfred P. Mora Federal Building at just after 9 a.m. He got out and walked eight blocks to a getaway car he had parked in an alley three days prior. He drove away and got on the highway, headed east. The bomb exploded at 902 a.m. and destroyed a third of the federal building where the truck has now had a crater 30 feet or 9 meters wide and 8 feet or 2.5 meters deep. The blast damaged 324 buildings within a four-block radius and shattered the glass in 258 surrounding buildings. 86 vehicles were either burned or destroyed. The bombing was estimated to have caused at least $650 million worth of damage. 168 lives were lost in the explosion. 19 of those lives were children in the building's on-site daycare facility, the youngest being only three months old. More than 680 injuries were reported. Police, firefighters, and paramedics arrived on the scene with the National Weather Service, the Air Force, the Civil Air Patrol, and the American Red Cross. Civilians from the nearby area ran to the scene and assisted in the rescue operation. An hour later, the Oklahoma National Guard sent 465 members to help with the rescue and provide security. The 1996 movie Twister was filming in the area, and some of the cast and crew stopped filming and assisted with recovery efforts. Over 12,000 people participated in the rescue. FEMA sent 665 rescue workers, and 29 canine units were used to help search for bodies. The rescuers would often stop and be silent for a period of time so that high-sensitivity listening devices could be used to locate survivors. One rescue worker was struck on the head by a piece of falling debris and died, bringing the death total to 168. McVeigh chose April 29 to carry out his plan because it was the anniversary of the day that federal agents raided the Waco compound. McVeigh was open about his anger over the event. His actions were heavily motivated as retaliation against the federal government for what he saw as crimes against the American people. About 90 minutes after the explosion, Oklahoma State Trooper Charlie Hanger pulled over a yellow 1977 Mercury Marquis for not having a license plate. The driver was Timothy McVeigh, who was just four days away from his 27th birthday. Trooper Hanger placed McVeigh under arrest for having a concealed weapon and booked him into jail, too. Trivial details would ultimately bring down the deadliest domestic terrorist in U.S. history, the license plate. McVeigh took his 1977 Mercury Marquis from the alley where he had parked three days prior and headed west on I-35 when he parked in the alley. He had removed the license plate and put a note on the windshield, explaining that the vehicle would be repaired and removed on April 23 and not to tow it. He placed that note over the VIN on the dash so the police wouldn't run the vehicle in the system. The problem was that he didn't want to spend the time to put the license plate back on before he made his escape. Once on the interstate, he was pulled over by an Oklahoma state trooper and arrested for driving without a license plate and illegal firearms possession. McVeigh did have a concealed weapons permit, but it wasn't valid in Oklahoma. Trooper Hanger said he would have just given McVeigh a ticket and let him go if it hadn't been for the discovery of the gun holstered under his windbreaker. McVeigh was intended to see a judge the following morning, where he would have likely been released afterward. But due to delays, McVeigh was still in jail three days later when the police got a call to place him on hold to be questioned by the FBI. Meanwhile, while authorities were investigating the bombing, they found an axle thrown two blocks from the blast site. The axle still had a visible vehicle identification number etched into it, and it came back to a Ryder box truck. Eyewitnesses said they saw a man pull up and exit a yellow Ryder box truck just before the blast, so authorities tracked the vehicle further and found that it had gone to Elliott's Body Shop in Junction City, Kansas. At the rental company, the employees said, a man named Robert Kling had rented the truck, and they gave a description for a sketch artist. 
After publishing the sketch in the media, Leeds came in directing them to a Junction City motel, where McVeigh had rented a room under his own name. He had also ordered Chinese food while there, but the name he gave to the restaurant was Robert Kling. That cemented the fact that Timothy McVeigh and Robert Kling were the same people. After running McVeigh's social security number and finding out that he had recently been arrested, they called and told the sheriffs to put an immediate hold on him. McVeigh stated in his deposition to his lawyer that he chose to drive without a license plate because he knew he would be arrested anyway. He believed that he didn't know what he would do after the bombing and didn't think he could fight a solo war. So he made a conscious effort to get arrested. It's believed that he thought he would be considered a martyr and spark a massive uprising where the people would rise and take the country back from its tyrannical leaders. That didn't happen. On August 21, 1995. After identifying McVeigh as their main suspect, authorities transferred him to Oklahoma City. They picked up his getaway car the same day Terry Nichols surrendered himself to police in Kansas after learning that authorities were looking for him. Nichols' brother James Nichols was also arrested but released for lack of evidence. Terry Nichols was found guilty in federal court of conspiring to build a weapon of mass destruction and eight counts of involuntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to life without parole. He was also found guilty in an Oklahoma court of 161 counts of first-degree murder and given 161 consecutive life sentences without parole. Michael Fortier and his wife, Lori, were also arrested as accomplices because they were aware of the plan ahead of time, and Michael had helped scout locations. Michael and Lori Fortier made a deal for a reduced sentence for Michael and immunity for Lori in exchange for Michael's testimony. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison and given a $75,000 fine for failing to warn authorities about the attack. He was released in 2006 and placed in the Witness Protection Program on June 2, 1997. Timothy McVeigh was found guilty of conspiracy to use a weapon of mass destruction, use of a weapon of mass destruction, destruction with explosives, and eight counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death. This was the case for the federal charges, and the murder convictions were for the eight federal officers who died in the blast. Oklahoma's state would have prosecuted the remaining 160 deaths, but they chose not to file charges once McVeigh was sentenced to death. He made several statements leading up to his execution that showed he had no remorse for his actions and would do it again if given a chance, even knowing that children were in the building on July 11, 2000. 1. Timothy McVeigh was executed by lethal injection. He did not make a final statement. He was 33 years old. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up. Leave us a comment, and make sure to hit the subscribe button to ensure you don't miss a video.